Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 40. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 40. We're continuing our series on life. With our series in life and transition. And this is part two. I encourage you to go back onto our podcast or YouTube to listen to part one of Life in Transition where we really laid out the fact that one of the most constants in life is change and that we'll often find ourselves in the midst of transition. But the goal of this series is to give you an action guide and some wisdom steps to take when you find that you're in the midst of transition and how to transition well. Because with transition, if you manage it and steward it well, you always enter a, realm, enter a new realm of promotion. And ultimately, what I believe is that God doesn't want you to stay stuck. God doesn't want you to stay stagnant. He doesn't want you to keep praying the same prayers over and over and over again. I believe that God wants you to start praying some new prayers, having some new dreams, because what you used to pray, you're now walking in. Uh, but in order to get to those points and those levels, you're going to go through a level of transition. But today... I want to begin to describe how transition sometimes feels in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And it says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus, in the midst of that storm, was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are all going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith. We need to go ahead and give some context to what we're reading here and just kind of humanize the disciples just a tad bit uh, in that it was just a chapter before that Jesus had called them to walk alongside them. So he hadn't had a lot of time with them. And so as they just started off with him right after he had a really a seminar on faith, uh, the first encounter or the first test that they have was one where they thought their life was going to be over. And often in the storms of life, they're similar to the storms that were found here in the sea or the Lake of Galilee because it was notorious for its storms, but there's the storms in the sea or the Lake of Galilee had a unique characteristic in that they were extremely fierce and they came out of nowhere. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but you may have just been minding your own business in life when all of a sudden a storm comes out of nowhere, whether it be in your family and your finances, dealing with your future, dealing with your thoughts, dealing with your body. You just don't, didn't know how to call it. You had no time to prepare, but now you're here. So what do I do? And A unique statement that was seen at the beginning of Mark chapter 4, I want to let you all know, is often people think that storms come because they're disobedient, but I want to show you in our opening text that this storm came after the consequence of their obedience. So storms sometimes show up because you are doing what's right. But nevertheless, the ferocity of the storms doesn't change because you obey God. And so now these disciples who trusted Jesus with their life, who obeyed the word of the Lord, are in a storm that they believe the end of their life is near. A writer described the storm like this. He said, it's not unusual to see these terrible squalls and see them hurl themselves even when the sky is perfectly clear upon these waters which are ordinarily so calm. The fishermen that Jesus selected to go with him typically didn't go out as far as they were with him in that moment. And if you're honest, well before you met the Lord, you played it a whole lot safer than you do right now. And it's unnerving at times to fully trust God with your whole life, hear what he says, 
and get to a place where you can do nothing but trust him to save you. And so there are three categories of storms that you may encounter. Number one, and that come out of nowhere, that come without planning, that come without warning. Number one, it's a storm of sorrow. The other category of storms that you sometimes get without warning, without planning, and come out of nowhere and they're completely fierce are storms of doubt, storms of tension, and storms of uncertainty. Final category of storms that you can face without warning, without planning, and even in the midst of you obeying God is a storm of anxiety. And I know we're all super saved in here, and we don't really want to admit that we have anxiety at times because we operate in faith. And there, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. And so I'm not anxious, although I'm just wringing my hands. I haven't had a good night's sleep in a few weeks, and I don't like taking days off because I don't really trust the Lord to do what he said he's going to do because I'm a person of faith. But then there's, there's this doubt that sets in when we're in the midst of a storm and we're feeling the real feelings because you are a real human with real feelings. And if we just get honest, our first prayer is not, oh, Lord, I know that you're in this boat with me. It's, oh, Lord, don't you care that I'm about to die? Don't you care that I'm about to go under? Don't you care that I'm not going to make it? Don't you see what's going on around me? Why don't you help me? I want you to notice that Jesus did not take the disciples out of the storm, but he gave them the word in the midst of the storm to calm it down in their life. But he still had a mission for them to accomplish. Sometimes when you obey God, you get to a point where there's a point of no return. And that's when you're really in faith. If you could go back to how life used to be, you still are doing your own plan. But in transition, and in, I believe, the places that God has taken you, he, he doesn't want you to end up stepping back from what he's asked you and having to have start over after start over after start over after start over. At some point, you're going to have to say, the reason why I keep stepping out is because there's a holy discontent with where I'm currently at. And you've got to be open to that. But I want us to examine this storm over the next few weeks in a message, in a subtitle of our Life in Transition series called The Perfecting Storm. How many of you have heard The Perfect Storm before? Where it seems like all the conditions come together and it makes a storm that will break record books. Well, I want to play off that to show you how the storms of life are actually designed to help you be a better version of yourself. And so we're going to look at the perfecting storm. So when I find myself in transition, in the midst of a storm of sorrow, in the midst of a storm of doubt, tension, uncertainty, in the midst of a storm of anxiety, instead of thinking that God is not with me, our mind should shift to say, God, how are you going to work through me in what I'm facing? Because I'm going to come out of what I'm dealing with with a greater dependence, with a greater revelation of who God is. But I want to show you something about Jesus. And this is going to help you unlock. Ultimately, once we get done with this particular series, you're going to be able to unlock a host of parables and really understand the key to understanding kingdom principles. And I'll show you that here in, in just a moment. But my heart is to show you that Jesus builds upon a lesson that he's taught. So if you've walked with God for any amount of time, he's been building you for the next request of obedience he will ask from you. And I believe this with all my heart, and I've heard it said many times before. If God showed you what he was ultimately going to ask you to do from the very beginning, we would all completely quit, turn around, and go the other direction. But the Lord stair steps you into divine obedience for your life. And every season is building upon the last so that you get to this point in your walk with God that it's not you dictating your plans, but you're truly surrendered to God and his plan. And so Jesus teaches in context. And so go all the way back to Mark chapter 4, verse 1. So we went to the end of Mark chapter 4 to look at 
the storm that they were in. But the lesson about this storm started in verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. And it says, once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. And then he sat on the boat, and while all the people remained on the shore, he taught them by telling them many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Verse 3, he says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with an underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun since it didn't have deep roots. It died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants so they they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted, grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as has been planted. I have a question for everybody in person and online. Anybody want to be like that fertile soil that whatever God places in your life, you return a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. In fact, during that particular time, to have a 7 to 10 fold harvest was considered exceptional. So what God is saying is that we all have the creative spiritual potential to produce at a minimum three times what's considered exceptional to the world. That's the potential that we have, but there are some things that we have to work through in the midst of transition in order to get that place where we're producing at an optimal level. But for the purpose of today, I want to focus in on verse 3, which says, a farmer went out to plant some seed. If you drop down to verse 14, what was that farmer planting? The farmer plants seeds by taking God's word to others. So the seed that it's referring to is the word of God. Someone say and type in, the seed is the word of God. God. And what I want to kind of help you out in, in, in when you start sensing certain leadings, because leaders are learners. You should never stop learning no matter where you are in life. Anybody who believes that they have learned all that there is to know about the certain area that they're in or in their life or there's nothing else they can learn, that person is going on a backwards trajectory. But every person who's a leader says, there's something that I can learn. There's a skill that I can develop. But the way the Lord leads you is that when transition is either happening or about to happen, he will put on your heart areas that you're to study ahead of time. If you've ever said, I don't know why the Lord is leading me to research this. I don't know. Anybody ever said that? I don't know why the Lord is leading me to research. I need to take some time to focus on this. When you see God lead you into areas of specific focus, you need to understand that there is going to be a test or a storm in that particular area. So instead of trying to fight the leading, Go ahead and tank up on what the leading is because in Psalm 23, 2 through 4 in the New King James, it says, speaking of the the good shepherd, which is the Lord, he said, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So even though there may be a storm all around you, his leading is going to show you how to be calm in the midst of the storms that will arise. Verse 3, it says, he restores my soul. Last week, I told you that the only constant in life is change, and through the midst of transition, transition takes a toll on the soul. So when you're being led by the Lord on what to read and what to discover and what to look at, it says that he restores your soul because the worst thing that can happen to you in a season of transition is you can get to the other side and be too burnt out to experience the blessings of the promised land. So he leads me in the path for, of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How can the rod and staff comfort me when the valley I'm going through looks like darkness and feels like death? Well, Psalm 119, 105 says, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet and a guide For my path, God's word that he leads and shares with you and places in your heart prepares you for the storms you're to face so that when you find them, you've already been there because God goes ahead of us long before we ever face what we're facing. 
So if I had someone who went ahead of me, that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is someone who has gone ahead of you to tell you of the trials that you're going to face. And we could either be hard-headed and say, well, that was you. Or we could say, well, you know what? You might have seen certain things that I need to prepare for, and I can be prepared in order to deal with what is ahead. Because in life, we have to learn that God has called us to be people who are proactive, not reactive. And so wisdom places you in a place of being proactive rather than always being subject to the winds and the waves of life. If you have a word from God, my Lord, if you have a word from God, that word is your anchor. That word holds you firm. That word reminds you when your feelings and when your eyesight and when your focus goes all over that if God has said it, That means it is so, no matter what comes my way. And if Jesus told them that they're going to go to the other side, what is the end result? They're going to go where? To the other side. But did he ever mention about the storms and the wind and the waves as they were going to the other side? No, because the surrounding distractions were inconsequential to the power and the force it took to get them to their destination. If God has placed a word in your heart, all of the distracting forces are simply that, distractions. All right, let's dig a little deeper. I want you all to write this down. Character is forged through seasons of transition. Character is forged through seasons of transition. I want to give you some wisdom here. In times of transition, it's imperative that you have a picture of the end goal in mind. Faith is about having the same picture in your heart that God has in his plan for your life. Faith is a vision. That's why we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is about seeing in a realm that is more permanent than the natural realm that we live in day to day. So when I get information from this temporary space, What I saw in the realm of the spirit trumps what I see in the natural. So that's why we're not moved by what we see. We're not moved by what we feel, even though what we feel has the power to get us to make a decision to move off what God said. So I need to keep an end goal in mind. What is the end result? And you need to lay hold to that like a dog on a new bone and not let it go under any circumstance. So I beg the question of what is the desired end to God being the sower that plants the seed of his word within us? Go to Psalm chapter one. Psalm chapter one. What is the end goal of this parable that we're going to embark upon over the next couple of weeks? Psalm chapter one. In verse 1, or are you supposed to say chapter? You're not supposed to say chapter, right? I'm sorry for all you Bible students. Psalm 1 <laughs> and 1. <laughs> In New Living Translation, it says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. Verse 2, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Well, here's God's end goal. Number three, they are like trees planted along a river bank. So him planting the seed in us is for us to bear fruit in certain seasons. That's what it says, right? No, it does not. You're not reading. Did that on purpose. You're to bear fruit in each, every season, always bearing fruit. Your leaves will never wither. So I don't care what everybody else says. I'm on a different climate. And they prosper in some of what they do. 
That's the purpose of this parable of the sower. So that you could bear fruit in every season. Your leaves will never wither. And everything you do prospers because everything you do is based off of the word. That's the end goal. So what is God's end goal? Number one, that you are a tree of life. And if you go back to the creation story, and this is for further study, so I want you all to write down because I don't have the time today. Genesis chapter 2, <laughs> verses 8 through 17, and Genesis chapter 3, that is your further study. If you want to flesh this out some more, um, I'm starting something called the pastor's office on Monday morning at 7 a.m. It used to be prayer, so I have a fun little cool name with it. Now it's the pastor's office because I'm the pastor and it's in my home office, pastor's <laughs> office. <laughs> And in that, I'll use that time to flesh out stuff I didn't get a chance to flesh out on Sundays. So join me at 7 a.m. But if, you're, if the Lord don't wake you up that early, then you can catch the replay. And then I'll see you at Bible study on Wednesday at 7 p.m. So I now have a meeting time for us at 7 a.m. for the early birds. And I also have a meeting time for those of you night owls at, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. So I don't want to hear it's either too early or too late because what you're telling me is you're too lazy. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I am not sorry. No, like we're going to get in this Bible or we not. We're going to be about this word or we not. We're going to get these roots or we not. Uh-uh. We make time for everything else in the world that we want to do and dog on it, we cannot forget the power of this word. So I make no qualms for the fact that I got Bible study multiple times a week. I got prayer multiple times a week. We have service once. (laughs) For now. And the reason we do that is so that as we begin to reintroduce life groups, you all are breaking down the word together. I'm only inspiring you right now. This is inspiration. Transformation comes when we get away from this setting and we begin to ask questions and wrestle with this word. I want to see our church transform, period. So, Psalm 1. Let me go back to my notes because I forgot the next scripture. So that's the first thing, the tree of life. He wants us to be a tree of life. And so tending to the garden of our heart will keep us from falling prey into relying on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, Psalm 1 described it in verse 1. It said that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and what that means is relying on what you think. Anything that's apart from what the word clearly and explicitly states, any adjustment you make to this word is partaking of the knowledge of good and evil and what you're thinking. And so what does that look like? Acting on wicked advice. Vying for the approval of others. That's what it means to stand around with sinners. It means I'm trying to get someone who is not God to validate what God told me. Oh, snap. I'm going to be good today, but I feel like sitting on that one just for a moment. You always want to check in with everybody else, but the main one who gave you the word and the power to do what he said. You really won't experience the true fulfillment God has for you until you're willing to be made fun of for doing what he told you to do. If you can't take folk talking about you and saying whatever it is that they want to say about you obeying the Lord, then you really aren't ready for the blessings that you see on the other side of your obedience. At some point, you got to be willing to let folks who ain't never did nothing with their life, who ain't going nowhere in their life, have conversations all day about you. But listen, y'all can talk all you want to talk, but while you're talking, I'm going to have you watch what God wants to do in my life. Listen, I refuse to let somebody who ain't never did nothing tell me about not doing something. They're good at that. I want people around me who know what it means to, I only got a handful of meal in order to do what God said, and I'm going to give God everything in my hand to do it. And when I put it in the hand of the master, he's able to return back more than I ever could have imagined. (laughs) 
I am tired of people who have never done nothing trying to tell people who are making the most out of the life that they have about what they should and should not do. Listen, respectfully, keep your non-moving opinion to yourself and wait till I'm done to open your mouth to see what God is doing in my life. I just, oh, I felt that one right now. Some people are waiting. You are waiting for everybody to get on your side if God be for you. I don't have time to wait for everybody to get their faith up. I don't have time to wait for everybody to get past their insecurity until I step out on what God has called me to do. I don't have time for people who can't see beyond their own life in order to give me the approval that I need. You did not call me. You did not bless me. You did not heal me. You did not save me. You did not set me free. So you don't get the right to tell me what I can and cannot do with my calling. This is life right here, y'all. I can't wait till next week because there's something. I already, see, so I, I made a deal with the Lord because I come from a background in ministry that refuse to let you enjoy your life until you've done all of your ministry obligations. But what I realized is that your ministry obligations never stop. So I told the Lord that how about we do this life together and we spend time with each other every day and we talk every day and then we enjoy life while doing life. And I found that I'm least likely to sin and to leave the ministry because there's nothing else I'd rather do with my whole life. So he wants us to be a tree of life. The second thing that we see in Psalm 1 is that God's end goal by planting the word in us is he wants us to be producers in every season of our life. In every season, God wants you to produce well. So if he wants us to be a tree planted by the rivers of water, then my next question is what type of fruit does he want to be on this tree? Go to Galatians chapter 5. In verse 22. So when we're a tree of life, we produce fruit of life, which is known as the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Anytime you're ready to quit, you have not maximized the fruit of the Spirit in operation in your life. So if you go through and look at each of the characteristics of the fruit of one Spirit, it's only one fruit, but many characteristics, multifaceted. If you look at the various characteristics of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, when you feel like giving up on your transition, where are you not maximizing a characteristic of Holy Spirit? So why is this so important? Go back to Mark chapter 4. Verse 10. Why am I spending time in this particular parable over the next few weeks? Verse 10. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what that parable meant that we read. 
Again, all of this is connected to the storm that they were in later on. Drop down to verse 13. Jesus said to them, and he's saying to us today, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable that we're about to unpack, how will you understand not some, all? So you mean to tell me what we're about to delve into with what I just read helps me understand every other parable, every other kingdom principle in the word of God? I don't know about you all. If I could understand this one, it unlocks them all. Who's ready to delve into this parable? Anybody ready to delve into this parable? Next week. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) Let's stand right now. Next week. I want to take my time. (laughs) Because, so, the Lord is working on me, y'all. And there's this new trend uh, amongst us clergymen and women that every Sunday we'll have a member of our social media team walking with us as we're leaving our pastor's study or leaving service and saying, bless men and women of God out there today. I want to let you know that the word, oh, manna, manna. And I want to tell you, this is the most important message. I'm telling you right now, you want to go back to my Spotify, my LimeWire, my Napster, and download this word. Because I'm telling you, ha, 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 God mm, has spoke through me to you today. But while I'm making fun of them, Jesus just said what we're reading. This is the most important message you will ever hear. So I'm asking y'all to lock in. Because you miss this lesson, you're going to be fumbling through scripture, fumbling through life unnecessarily. You need to understand the parable of the sower because they're characteristics of when the word goes forth. Give you a little samples for uh, next week. At church, we've done a great job of teaching the word so people can hear the word. And Romans 10 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We don't have a lack of revelation in the body of Christ. We have a lack of manifestation. So next week is about going from the revelation of the word to the manifestation in your life, y'all. I've always asked the Lord questions because I've seen different things in ministry and I've always wondered how. And for whatever reason, nobody wanted to tell me without buying a master class on seven principles of faith. But I want to show y'all how to manifest what you believe in for. I'm only sharing this for the sake of what you all can see. Last week, I had a moment holding Asher our son, who is a prayer. But I'm holding him inside of a new church building that was a prayer. And I told the Lord, if you could take my wife and I from where we were to where we are, let us be poured out so every person can understand that it's not by our power, not by our might, because we were so special. But Lord, show them that your grace is real. And cooperating with that grace until you see the promise. In 2018, March of 2018, driving in, uh, today is Grandparents Day, and I thought about my grandmother, my dad's mother. 
In March of 2018, my wife and I were in the middle of a truly dark season related to my calling, where it was so dark that I didn't know where my next check was coming from. There was no outlet community church. It was just my wife and I out seemingly just wondering, Lord, what next in the middle of this storm? In the midst of what I considered an extremely dark season in our life, my grandmother, who spent every Sunday in church all the days of her life, literally, you know, old school church in Detroit, which means church was in the neighborhood. So she got out the house, walked down two houses, and was at the church. She stayed at the church and was faithful to her church. All of a sudden had a stroke and died. It's the matriarch of our family. I'm in a season of uncertainty in my calling. And now, on top of grieving a season of loss, the matriarch of our family is gone. And during the service, my aunt, who... Uh, is a bishop in her own right, actually pastored here in the city of Atlanta. Um, As I told you all, at one point, my aunt pastored on Abernathy. And if you take Abernathy long enough, it turns into Georgia Avenue. And that's where King Middle School was off of. So for a second, my aunt and I were pastoring on the same street in the city of Atlanta, years apart. But my aunt, who was a powerful bishop, She deputized me and said, oh, no, you're a pastor now, too. And we're going to do this service together. And so in the area of my greatest pain, she pulled me close to her. And I can remember when they were closing the casket, thinking to myself, God, I don't know if I can take this. I didn't ask for this. This is too tough. And my aunt, who was the daughter of my grandmother, got up for special music. And she sang, my soul is anchored in the Lord. Somebody pulled the uh, vamp up, because I don't know that part. I know how the hint, the, 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 uh, I want to I want to quote the 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 middle part of the band the billows part who got the billows part who know that part what what that part say the billows may you know how you in that part you know when you on the stage you uh you rocking and you just moving your mouth to what it say yeah she got a hmm you yeah Absolutely illustrated sermon.
Because